the new fish market is moving, uh, and then Olympic Village is next door. So who you just heard there was John C.J. We had the chance to visit him in Tokyo just as he was about to move into a brand new office for Uniqlo. And that was quite the experience, wasn't it? The one thing about John's office is that when we first arrived, it was pretty sparsely furnished. I think it was just a byproduct of him slowly moving in. He had a few pieces of artwork. In the corner, there was like an antique car frame. The interior design of the whole office is kind of a byproduct of all of John's experiences and his relationships. That was one of the most interesting things to see someone who's been so heavily involved in the creative world, you know, deck out their office in a certain way. So why don't we tell everybody a little bit what it was like actually meeting John C.J. When we stepped into his office and we took the opportunity to meet him, one thing that always crossed my mind was, here's someone that's been so great at connecting the worlds of creativity and commerce, right? And I think that was generally the game plan. But once you start talking to John, I think a lot of things start running through your mind because he says so many illuminating things. And you're just kind of, you're trying to pick and choose what are things to pursue, especially knowing you only have a limited amount of time. And I I would say we definitely walked away with more than we expected. I couldn't agree more. So how did this whole day start? Kind of in a disarray. It was raining that day. We had taken the train over and switched to a taxi. But we, you know, Tokyo taxis can only hold four passengers. So we had to split up. Over the course of that ride, we were... You know, we left first and then you guys followed suit. And I remember we were lucky enough to be dropped off at the correct door. You know, it sounds like, oh, how hard can it be to find it? But the reality of it is it's a massive building. It feels as though it's several American football fields long, right? And getting dropped off the wrong exit actually means you're essentially lost. You have to find your way, there's security. And I guess that's kind of where you guys come in. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to us. Um, You guys were in one taxi. That's you, Cody, Elphick, and our good friend, Julia. And in the other taxi, the late one, that was me and Chris. So we were following you guys, but we got cut off in traffic. So we got separated for a good couple minutes and then we couldn't find you. So when we got to the building, which was, like you said, really big, we thought we were going to the right entrance. Uh, but actually that was the employee's only entrance. So Chris and I obviously don't want to you know, make a great first impression by breaking into Uniqlo headquarters. So we walked around the side of the building, got rained on before we finally found the entrance. And eventually we were reunited with you guys upstairs. Yeah, the whole day kind of started off on the wrong foot. But once we linked up with John, he was extremely welcoming and, and generous with his time. The first order of business was to take a tour of Uniqlo City. Naturally, this is such an impressive space. You can't help but wonder what's behind every corridor. What are all the stories that exist? So he took us on a tour. And that for sure wasn't a great experience in itself. I mean, we couldn't take any pictures, but uh, I'll just try my best to describe what it was like. So Uniqlo City is exactly as its name sounds. So there's this giant main street running down the center of the building which is actually very long and narrow. And on each side, you've got, you've got your different workspaces, you've got your conference rooms, you've got presentation halls, you even had a, a library, right? Yeah, I think the library had its own dedicated director that was in charge of curating everything you would see on the shelves. That was pretty impressive. Yeah, and just as you might expect, there's like hundreds of people essentially quote unquote commuting back and forth. There's people running around with the prototypical ID around their neck, documents on their arm, and kind of weaving in and out of traffic. John CJ's affinity for physical spaces of connection, which is a lot like FPO, which is the very thing we came to Uniqlo City to discuss with them, right? I think FPO is sort of a culmination of all of John CJ's experiences over the years to give back to the community and essentially usher in the next generation of creative culture. All of it somehow leads to that humanistic, uh, in, you know, engagement. This, this building that we're in today was created all for that. It's all about inspiration. Those porches that I, designed, that I showed you, it's all about bringing people out into the street. Um, so it, 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 everything ends up being still personal for me, you know. So 
Uh, the digital side is wonderful. I love uh, love all that technology. I'm connected to all our R and D centers around the world. I, uh, you know, it, it enables me to do things instantaneously without having to travel to to to, to Spain or to to London or whatever. And the end, it has to be in person. So everything ends up being in person with me. So that's why the space, that FPO space, it will be a, a place of engagement, you know, bringing people into a physical place. So physical places are really important to me, really important. So after our tour of Uniqlo City, he took us back upstairs to his office. And that's where we started to sit down and, and really talk about everything that he's working on currently. I think I remember one of the first things that really stuck out was how straightforward he was about his position and what it's like to be on the quote unquote creative spectrum. I've always been in commercial work. Yeah. I've never been an artist, never. So editorial, I work for magazines. The magazines survived by advertising. Uh, Bloomingdale's, you know, uh, was commerce. Uh, you know, um, Wyden and Kennedy, I had clients. Uh, so. I've always been in commerce, always, in, in terms of in mixing art, commerce and creativity was, uh, that was just natural. I mean, you can't have the commerce without the creativity. So I'm going to guess hearing that last part might be a bit jarring for some creatives out there, right? Some people are probably thinking, in what position or understanding does John CJ have about the creative? Not necessarily the, the relationship between creative culture and business, but the actual creative side. I mean, I could totally see that. Of course, there is always going to be that side of the industry, you know, which seems like it's, you know, unfair or it's exploitative of talented people. But I think to really understand where John CJ is coming from and why he has such a unique perspective, you really have to look back to the beginning of how he got started and his progression to where he is today. There's a lot of things that John said over the course of this discussion that really opened my eyes. There's a lot of stuff he says that I totally agree with and he tells it how it is. One thing is that before coming to this conversation, I always had a sort of misunderstanding, I'd say, about the friction required or the friction that existed between creatives and the business side. John broke it down in a way that suggested there's a way for both sides to coexist and what is the actual value or increased value that comes when both sides are sort of working together. Actually, this was my first time meeting him. So of course I was really intrigued by a lot of things he said. So when this was over, I actually looked more up on him and I found this TED talk that I found was really inspiring. Charles Wing Laundry and Dry Cleaning. So I grew up in the back. My dream back then in the transformation days, my dream was to have a living room. My dream was to have a sofa. My dream was to have a bedroom. So I grew up in this little space with no heating and no insulation. And I grew because I stepped outside and I saw wonderful things like this, objects of design such as this DeSoto. And that's how I learned how to speak English. So I would watch TV, recognize the commercial, go outside on the street corner and identify the cars. So that's my love of cars today is because it was through the automobile that I learned how to speak English. It's always fascinating how people's backgrounds and their upbringing influence who they are. I think there's something about John's story that extends far beyond just that little boy, son of immigrant parents who was enamored with great American classic cars wishing he could drive one. I think there's much more to it than that. It's important to point out that he did have a creative background. You know, it started very young and he was really big into drawing as a kid. Little known fact, he actually got in trouble for drawing on the walls and he entered a drawing contest that was on the back of a comic book, I think. And what happened was a representative came to his family's laundry, you know, told their, told his parents about their son's gift. Of course, he was just selling these drawing lessons that they couldn't afford and they didn't want anyways. But that was the first time in his life that he thought about becoming an artist. And that was sort of the start or the, the foundation behind his quote unquote artistic career. And he eventually went on to study visual communications in university. So what's visual communications again? Visual communications is conveying information and ideas through 2D disciplines. 
So it's typography, graphics, and images, etc. After coming out of school, he landed at Bloomingdale's, which, with a pretty unrelated portfolio and without an experience in retail or fashion, he basically worked his way up over the course of 12 years, climbing the ladder and becoming a creative and then marketing director. And in 1993, he started at Wyden and Kennedy. And that's based out of Portland, Oregon, right? Yeah, that's based out of Portland. He did this big campaign for Uniqlo in 1999 for their uh, fleece products. And it really got people behind the brand because he made this socially relevant or socially conscious campaign that really uh, struck a chord with people. Even though Wyden Kennedy and Uniqlo parted ways, he left a lasting impact on Tedeschi and I, the founder of Uniqlo's parent company, Fast Retailing, who eventually linked up with John in late 2014 when John came on board as Fast Retailing's global creative president. Under this role, John's responsible for accelerating and sustaining Uniqlo's expansion into the Western world. Here's a huge thing that I actually did not consider before. I think some of us, myself included, still have this image of, you know, creativity at the corporate level being, you know, shallow or exploitative. But in John's eyes, there's actually a lot of opportunity there too. I was having lunch, uh, not here, but my other office in Tokyo, and uh, my good friend John Elkin, who is the chairman of Fiat, he said to me, uh, do you you have a problem working for a big company at a big company? And I said, absolutely not, because that's been the secret, that thing, it's unlocked so much for me. I mean, it's given me an education beyond my means, certainly. You know, as a son of immigrant Chinese parents, you know, this was my grad school, going to Paris, going to the Prêt-à-Porter, going to all the design museums all over the world. I came through commerce. That came through working with successful businesses that allowed me to educate myself and to help spread that inspiration to other people. John didn't just pull off these really impactful campaigns for the likes of Nike and Uniqlo. They weren't just about making really great ads. There's a reason why Tadashi and I created a position just for him so that he would eventually join the company. For one, John's work certainly boosted Uniqlo's profile in sales in Japan, but there's also a sense of influence that he was able to create throughout the company. And there's something that he's altered in their DNA that's still relevant today. Sometimes much more than that, but you can't escape, but money helps and so forth. Well, uh, helping people to achieve things that they couldn't achieve, even if it was just mo- you know, beyond money. You know, I've had artists, obviously I've had a long relationship with artists that come from the world of graffiti or street and whatever, whatever that is called anymore today. And one artist said to me in particular, he said, I, my art is flat and it's on the wall. I would love to see it travel through time and space. Got it. So I put best filmmakers together, the best technologists together, and studios together, and suddenly, you know, that art is traveling through Shanghai, and I'm mixing different artists together. We're making videos, and I'm bringing in musicians and so forth to create this this thing. And that was for a client. Uh, and then later, I, I did it for ourselves, meaning uh, WK Tokyo Lab, which was our independent music label that we had created in, in Japan. I guess going into this initially. John was not necessarily the first person I'd picture when I thought the word creative. But now I see that you could definitely argue he creates, he just creates at the macro level. Maybe you can explain a little bit more to people what that means. Before this, I'd always thought of creatives in terms of hard skills like writing, playing an instrument, or, you know, drawing. But what he does is he creates, but he does so by finding talent, putting them together and executing these really large scale projects. Yeah, he's definitely assumed the role of this connector. He finds different opportunities for people that he feel when they combine and they synergize, the output is that much better. It's every day that you're in this position, I, I, I make sure I learn something. I make sure I meet interesting people. But the great luxury I have is I, I get to meet the most interesting people in the world. And to be fair, I make it my job to meet the most interesting people in the world too, because then I can share it with people. And that's great joy. I do a lot of connecting. I do a lot of, you're interested in what? You're interested in what? And for no reason other than being able to say, I put them together. I just think for me, that has proven to be a great uh, producer of good karma. 
And if you just create good karma around you, then other people will benefit as well as yourself. But I'm, I'm just learning, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on anything. I'm still impressed with how humble he is. Like you heard him, he's really self-effacing. But another thing that I gathered from our time with him is that he's also super pragmatic too. I really appreciate the balance he has. He's really approachable, but I don't know if it's a business side talking. There's also a very strong sense of realism behind how he approaches projects. I guess you kind of have to be. I'm not out to help everyone. I can't afford to do that, you know, and there's a bit of selfishness in here. I want to engage with people who interest me. I want to engage with people who will, I can learn from. I want to engage with people who will teach me new things and take me to new places. So uh, I'm not a bank out there, you know, I'm, I, I have an interest in this and in that I want to engage with people that I can sit across the table with and be excited about. I mean, I can't tell you there are times when I have meetings with groups of people and I hang up the phone or I turn off the, the video conference and I look at my team, I, go, I just pound my fist on the table. Holy crap, that was so unbelievably interesting. I mean, you're just floating off the chair because the intellectual discussion and the creative discussion was at such a high level. The brain cells were at such a high level. It was extraordinary. That I'll do every day. That I'll take any time, any day. Well, I certainly can't take credit for this. Uh, uh, so let's say I was a contributor to it. And that is the, 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 to, to be immersed into culture and to somehow to advance culture and somehow to contribute back to culture rather than just stealing from it, rather than just being inspired by it, but to be a contributor back to the culture. After getting to know him a lot more, I get this idea that what makes Jay so unique is that, yes, he does act as this unique bridge between culture, commerce, and creativity. But the big thing is, he seriously believes in that synergy between those three. I especially agree with you about contributing back to culture. It's really too easy these days for big companies to sort of mine popular culture, see what's relevant or popular, and find a way to apply that to a selling tactic. Just look at memes, right? John understands that for him and to create a more impactful culture in society, it's about helping the next generation. How can I help you? How can I bolster your cause? It's interesting to see a man of so much experience take all that and apply it into something physical and tangible that's his own, which is the creation of FPO. Well, you know, uh, I, I love typography. I love photography and I love relationship between words and photographs. I love, the, uh, I love, I always say that a great typographer, a great layout artist can almost do anything because it's all about relationship. It's about storytelling. It's about visuals. It's about words and language. It's about pagination. It's about uh, uh, how you take a reader through the course of a story, you know, the start, the middle, the end, the, you know, the editorial well, the upfront pages, the sidebars, the quotes, all of that is about storytelling. And that's when designing this space, you know, uh, the architect, you know, you could argue that this was very much about storytelling as well. So if you remember what we were saying earlier, John's love for storytelling through the page goes all the way back to his university days. But what's interesting for me is that after so many years doing great work for big brands, it seems like he's finally stepping out on his own to do something in his medium of choice. Right at the first of the year, I uh, made it a point to just kind of, a lot of times when I write, I'm just speaking to myself, yeah. you know? and just clarifying thoughts and I'm just putting it down on a, on a keyboard and writing it out and I decided to uh, make it official. I, things become official when you announce them somehow and then you have to, now you have to go do it, you know. And So I took a new space next to uh, the Creative Lab and Studio J in Portland, Oregon and this, um, this space at that time was unnamed. I didn't even have, a, I just had the concept for it. So now I've, I've named it and it's called uh, For Position Only, FPO. So, you know, uh, for those who come from graphic design or in print or editorial and remember mechanicals and remember having to, to put artwork down on paper or things like that for position only has a special meaning, you know, 
So it also is about something that's not permanent. Uh, for position only means it's only there to hold the position uh, or for placement only. I think some people say for placement. For me, I grew up FBO is for position only. And it is a space that number one is to express, uh, to, to selfishly to help me uh, with what, something I love and that's print. After hearing the vision of what FPO represents, John's certainly humble about it, but the implications for budding artists are anything but selfish. I love uh, visual images and print and so forth, but I wanted to combine it with something else and that was really uh, the world of art and helping young artists to find find a way to reach out to the world. Um, one of the things that I'm able to do with young talent is to really help expose them to, to a, a bigger world. And quite frankly, bring that bigger world to, uh, and expose them to, you know, to new forms of art, new types of art, new, new artists and, and so forth. So that space is going to be making things. Think of uh, maybe one inspiration is printed matter, of course. So making things and visual images, anything from zines to books to posters to printed poetry, you know, and it'll be all forms of print uh, as a start. But I also want it to be a combination of 2D, 3D, virtual. So it'll be a gallery at some point. So that'll be a 3D space. But the product that we make is 2D. It's worth mentioning that beyond just acting as a place to showcase this finished work, FBO stands as sort of this base of operations that includes mentorship and logistical support. And although work on FBO is still underway, it comes at a time when Portland's rapidly changing. There's tension and conditions for creativity that might be financially prohibitive. And along the way, some of it's even socially unwelcome. John's very aware of these issues, but he sees it from a bigger picture. Well, let me go back a little bit. Uh, there, there was a very famous governor who made the famous statement of he loved the tourism and the money that brought. So come visit Portland, but please don't, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not doing a very good job, but don't stay here. Meaning, come visit us, but don't live here. Don't move here. And that that, that spirit remains uh, in Portland. Uh, there are those who just want to shut the gate behind them and preserve a way of life because there is a way of life that's beautiful that's being lost. So this this real estate boom that's happening, wonderful old buildings that are being torn down block by block. So there's a struggle in kind of historical uh, preservation of buildings and so forth. Prices are increasing to the level you have apartments and commercial spaces that local Portlanders can't afford. And they are seen as being uh, spaces that are only afforded by young people, or, or not young, but people moving in from California or New York or wherever. But all cities are going through some of that. I mean, look at Manhattan today versus 20 years ago, you know. Um, so that tension, that's called, unfortunately or fortunately, is called progress. That's just the, this is how you handle progress, how you curate it, how you, how you control it, how you use it to benefit the greatest number of people. In the almost hour we spent with John, it went by really quickly, but we came away with one key learning. Overall, this relationship between business, arts, and creativity is often seen as a tense one. But under the right conditions and the right ratio, all three of them together can actually help each other thrive. I think it just depends on the mix. If you can understand how to do all three correctly, you can achieve some really big things. Like from the outside looking in, it looks like John CJ is a rarity. Like it's impossible to achieve the type of skill set or perspective that he has. But I'll leave off with saying he actually has a very simple explanation for how he got to where he is today. This definitely applies to creatives, no matter where they are on the creative spectrum. You just make stuff up and go do them. Hey, I want to do this, and you just go do it. I don't, I don't want to sound like an old fogey, but uh, you know, there's a, and that's not a generational statement so much now. Yeah.